Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining with us once again. On behalf of Church and Christian Fellowship, we'd like to welcome you to our morning service this morning once more. And we thank Stephen Bartley for bringing a message from God's Word this morning and to Sammy Lee for leading our time in praise. We hope you enjoy our service and that you can feel God's presence through um, the message and through the music and praise. Just in the way of announcements, we've got uh, our prayer and Bible study Zoom call happening again on Wednesday evening and we'd encourage you to link in and join in in prayer. Uh, we've had some really good times recently over the Zoom call uh, and prayer time so just please uh, join in at 8 o'clock on Wednesday evening. Keep an eye out on the WhatsApp. Also uh, we've got our fellowship uh, website uh, has been launched um, and uh, John Mark has been working hard getting that uh, website together so please have a wee look on the web. It's www scfwell.org that's www.scfwell.org and you can keep an eye um, and keep up to date what's happening there so we pray that you enjoy our service once more and uh, look forward to seeing you all soon
Hi guys, I hope you're keeping well at this time. Today what we want to start is a new series. And uh, we sometimes fail to start series in the fellowship because we want to emphasize truth that you can't really cover maybe in a single message and just to go a bit deeper in our understanding of things. And what I want to start a series on today is about a disciple of Jesus Christ. I really want to look at what it means to be a true disciple of the Lord Jesus. Now, the reason I'm going into this is because we're living in really critical times. I was listening to a lady share, she was a pastor from down south, and she was sharing just how that God spoke to her during the lockdown. And it said to her that don't expect all of your people to come back when the lockdown ends. She said that God spoke to her and said there's a great sifting taking place in the church at the moment. And I can agree with her. I do believe that this whole lockdown is a massive sifting. And you know what sifting is if you're a farmer. It's, it's where you take, as it were, the, the mix of the harvest. And under violent pressure, it's shook. And whatever is, is heavyweight, whatever it has substance, remains. But whatever is like fleety, lightweight, is blown away by the pressure. And that's a really troubling thought because, I mean, Jesus said to Peter, Satan desires to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. In other words, that even when Peter was sifted, the only reason why Peter held on and didn't give up on Jesus and didn't give up on the word of God was because he was a disciple and because Jesus was praying for him. And so I realize that this time we're living in a season of immense, immense sifting. But also, I believe we're entering into a time of great shaking. And just because we've gone through this now for nearly 12 months in the UK and Ireland, that does not mean our shaking is going to end. In fact, Jesus said when we're entering into the last days, before he would return onto the earth, He said that there would be ever-increasing shakings. He described it as birth pangs. And of course, you know with a birth pang, it may start like a twinge, but then it intensifies, 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 and it becomes more regular, more frequent, and indeed more painful. And I believe as we come closer to the return of Jesus, we're going to see immense shaking, immense shaking, such as we've never seen before. And the crucial question for you And for me is this, are we disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we disciples? Now, before I go any further, before I even go into the scripture I want to read today, we have to realize this, discipleship is not an added extra of the Christian life. There are some people out there and they'll give you the impression that if you've walked up the aisle, if you've said the prayer, if you've raised your hand, if you've asked Jesus into your heart, then that means that you're all right. And so this discipleship talk, well, it's just for those that are a wee bit more earnest or a wee bit more eager in the Christian walk. I want to dispel that as a false teaching. That is not true. For instance, if you read throughout the book of Acts, every time it makes mention of a Christian, it says they were disciples. So you cannot separate asking Jesus into your life and discipleship. They are one and the same. And if you are not a disciple of the Lord Jesus, if there isn't this desire to follow him, then I would dare ask you, are you a Christian at all? And you see, I fear, this is a fear that I have generally for for Christians at this time, is that so many of them, so many Christians have such a shallow conversion, such a shallow conversion in the sense that, you know, they haven't heard a very proper gospel. They've, they've only heard, as it were, basic messages about, you know, God loves you or, you know, vague stuff about why Jesus died or something. But they've never heard a deep gospel that explains the gospel to them, that their faith is rooted and grounded in the truth of the word of God. Tragically, that has not been the case. I remember one time speaking to someone outside a nightclub and they were out drinking and doing all their partying, but they were going to church the next morning. And we're honestly convinced they were Christians. And I asked the fellow, you know, um, do you understand the message of the Bible? Do you understand the gospel? And he said, oh, sure, Jesus died for me. And I, I stopped him there and I said, but what do you mean by that? 
what do you mean that Jesus died for you? And he just went blank and his facial expression. And he just said, I, I've never thought about that. I, I never thought, what does that mean for Jesus to die for me? I mean, what does that actually mean? It's like a buzz phrase. It's like a familiar thing, but we actually don't know what it means. And what, by the way, what it means is that Jesus took the death sentence that you and I deserve. Our sin would have led us to death. It would have led us to separation from God and judgment from God. And that would have been a fair settlement from God's end and from our end. But Jesus loved us and he took that punishment so that we could go free. And that's the very heart of the gospel. But what I fear is that many people, like that young man who honestly would have believed, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of the Lord. I, I, you know, I'm going to church on a Sunday morning. But if you asked him, are you a disciple? He'd say, but you know, I, I'm not really into that. I mean, I, I, I nominally identify as Christian. That's how I see myself. I'm not a Hindu, I'm not a Buddhist, I'm not this, that, and the other. But I'm not really an all-out disciple for Jesus. And that's the scary predicament that we find ourselves in today. I want to turn to Mark chapter 8 for, for a wee time this, the, today. In Mark chapter 8, and the, book, the gospel of Mark is a fascinating gospel because about a third of its content, I mean, that's quite a remarkable thing when you take this on board. A third of the gospel of Mark is taken up with the last week of Jesus' life. Imagine you picked up a biography of any leading historical figure, okay? And you would read about, you know, their upbringing. You'd read about their education. You'd read about maybe relationships they had. You'd read about their achievements or whatever. And then there would be a little chapter at the end about their death. And I mean, it would only maybe be 10, 15 pages at most. And in that, they're describing their legacy. But with the life of Jesus recorded by Mark and his gospel, it's at least a third, 33% of the content of Mark's gospel is concerned with the last week of Jesus' life. It is remarkable when you really think about that. The emphasis that is laid on the death of Jesus because it's so important. It's so important. And on the by and by in Mark's gospel, he's trying to explain who Jesus is. So when you start to read through Mark's gospel for maybe the first nine or so chapters, the question is, who is this Jesus? Who is he? I mean, the demon said, we know who you are. The people are asking who you are. The disciples are asking, who are you, Lord? And they're asking all of these questions. And then in, in about chapter nine or so, Jesus starts to reveal himself. He reveals himself and he says that he's the Christ, he's the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And for the remainder of Mark's gospel, he explains why Jesus, who is the Messiah, who is the Son of God, would need to die on the cross why he would have to go and endure the cross like he did. But here we have a really interesting episode in the final week or the final few weeks even of Jesus' life. If you look at the context there of Mark chapter 8 and verse 31 and 33, Jesus gives a very powerful announcement. He gives a prophecy about his death. He said in 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So Jesus was prophesying his death and his resurrection. Interestingly, Jesus gave three prophecies to his disciples about his death and his resurrection. And after each prophecy, it intensifies and he adds extra details. He makes it more clear that he's going to suffer a very, very humiliating death, but he will rise again. And so, in a sense, Jesus was telling these disciples, men, we are going headlong. They're heading to Jerusalem. We're going headlong into a season of immense sifting, into a season of immense shaking. And you need to take this on board. And Peter, as he often did, he stood up and it says he opened his mouth and as someone said, his foot soon arrived in the mouth. But in 32, it says, uh, when Jesus spoke this openly, uh, Peter took him aside. I, I just think that's amazing that Peter would have that boldness to do that. But he took him aside. 
And he began to rebuke him and was saying to him, you know, you're not going to die, Lord. I mean, all this doom and gloom message, that's not going to happen, Jesus. I mean, come on, show a little bit of sense. That's what he was saying to him. And there's many Christians today in their naivety just says, well, we're just going to go into a bright new future. Everything's going to get nice and better and good and so on and so forth. I mean, that's a very naive position to take. When you think about the pressure that God's putting on nations right now, and, and we think that things are going to go back to normal. Friends, the days of normal are well and truly over. We're living in abnormal times. We are living in super normal times. We have to get ready. We have to adapt ourselves to get ready for those times. And Jesus was saying to the disciples, in effect, you're going to have to get ready for the times that are lying ahead of you. And this is what he then he rebukes Peter and, and actually rebukes Satan. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are mindful of the th you're not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. May I bring this to you right here, right now. In the time, in the season that we are in, I want to really seriously ask you, what are the things that you're savoring? What are the things that you're really prioritizing? What are the things that you're looking for? Because I can tell you who you're listening to. If you savor the things of men, if you're pursuing money, if you're just pursuing happy families, if you're just pursuing your best life now, you are listening to an enemy. Even as nice and presentable and inoffensive that may be, but you're listening to the voice of an enemy because Jesus said Satan always is mindful of the things of men. So this get back to normal narrative, that is not the voice of God in this season. In fact, Jesus said, we must be mindful of the things of God. What's God wanting to do? What's God saying? What's close to God's heart at this particular time? And that's an interesting way thought there that Jesus was giving to the disciples. But as soon as he makes the announcement of his death, that critical shifting and shaking period, when he rebukes Peter, for listening to the wrong authority, listening to Satan and not to God, he then gives a very interesting teaching. And it's interesting when you read the remainder of Mark's gospel, really from this point onwards, Jesus no longer does public teaching, but it's private ministry to his disciples, to his inner team, to prepare them for the days that were lying ahead. And if you look here at Mark chapter 8 and verse 34, and we'll maybe just... Uh, We'll read it all, Sheriff, just for the context. Mark 8 and verse 34. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say unto you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. And that was what Jesus was giving to these disciples as they were heading into a season of shaking and sifting and when their world was possibly going to be turned right upside down. Jesus was emphasizing to these men and to all those who were gathered around him what it meant to be a disciple. And I want to emphasize that to you today that discipleship is the key for this time. I thought it was interesting. I listened to a reliable man of God, a prophetic character, and he was saying that the next number of years, churches will not be marked by the numbers that they have going to their meetings. A church will not be, its success will not be marked by its building programs and about so all these other things that we judge success by. But what it will be marked by is the disciples that it makes, the type of people that they make and also the ability to deal with persecution. And I would dare say to us, we need to start thinking along those lines. As I say, banish the thought of normal. 
I doubt we're going to see normal days as we knew in our past. We need to just adapt with God. We can't be a relic of the past. We can't be a museum piece. We must be movement makers. We have to keep moving with God. And, and, and you know, like somebody that uh, is surfing, we must surf the wave, whatever that wave may be. But I want to look at this one thing today, just as an introduction. And it's verse 34. I want you to take this picture to your mind of all these multitudes of people, starry-eyed, looking at Jesus, thinking he was a great, famous celebrity preacher, teacher. They even looked at him with political aspirations and thought he's the Messiah. He's the one who's going to defeat the Romans. He's the one who's going to overcome all of our enemies. And they were really just looking at him with incredible awe and wonder. And really, they were stupefied, you could call it. But Jesus turns to the crowd who were not all disciples. There were some people there that were you know, just following him for entertainment. They were just there because there was a bit of a buzz and they wanted to follow him. But then there was a core of people that were his disciples. And Jesus makes it so clear, whoever desires to come after me, whoever desires to come after me, he starts a teaching on what a disciple really is. Now, first question, what is a disciple? Well, literally a disciple means somebody who is a learner or a student. It is somebody that has dedicated their life to learn from another person. It indicates humility. It indicates a a missing sort of sense of absence in their life, a lack that they know that they can't fill in themselves. And so a disciple of Jesus Christ is a humble person that is teachable, correctable, open to the voice and the word of a teacher. And we need that brand of Christians today. Too often I have seen know-it-alls parade themselves into the house of God and parade themselves out and they've criticized and lambasted the leaderships of churches and they've lambasted preachers and teachers and pastors and all this sort of, and they've read the riot act, so to speak, to all these people. But you often have found they're not teachable. They're not teachable. And, And dare I said, if the Lord himself came down from heaven and stood in their midst, they still wouldn't listen to him. And even Jesus lamented that in the book of Revelation. He said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. So we have to really be teachable in this season. And that's what the the heart of a disciple is. They're a student and they're a learner. Now, the second thing I want to bring to you is this. In the time of Jesus, there were many, many disciples. We sometimes think of Jesus, disciples, disciples, Jesus. They're all together, all the same thing. But I want you to realize that in the days of Jesus, there were multiple forms of disciples. There were many, many groups of disciples. I mean, for instance, the Bible talks about there were disciples of John the Baptist. The Bible talks about there were disciples of the Pharisees, disciples of the Sadducees. Even the Bible makes mention of the the disciples of Moses, those who were like an exclusive group of the Jews that went back to the roots of Moses and the teachings of the law. So in Jesus' day, I mean, discipleship was quite a popular trend. And if you dig a little bit into the background of discipleship in the days of Jesus, you have to look at the education system. And the education system in the days of Jesus was absolutely amazing because it was quite advanced for its time. It offered education to every child. Now, there were three basic schools, three stages of education during the days of Jesus. And these were the three names that were given to them. The Bet Sephith, Bet Sephith, which was known as the House of the Book, that's what it was known as, and this was something that was offered in synagogues, and it was for children, boys and girls, from the age of six through to the age of ten, and they were taught the Torah. They were taught the first five books of the Bible and maybe some of the prophets, and they were really encouraged to memorize the Scripture. So that's what they did. Jesus would have went through that as a, as a six to ten year old boy. He would have went through the Bet Sereth. He would have went through that and would have been taught in the house of the book. From the age of ten to twelve, now this was only for boys. This women's education only went to the age of ten. But then there was the second stage, which was the Bet Talmud, which was the house of learning. And that was for 10 to 12 year old boys just before their bar mitzvah. And it focused on studying interpretations of the Torah and the scripture. And out of that group, let's say that there was a promising young prodigal, a prodigy rather, that there was this promising academic in their midst 
they were then encouraged to join the third stage of education, which was known as the Bet Midrash, which was the house of study. And Jesus more than likely would have been gifted to be in that third stage from the age of of, uh, 13 onwards. And they would have studied for 17 years under a rabbi. And the rabbi would have trained that young man in the oral traditions of the Jews. They would have been trained in interpretation. They would have been trained in the finer points of the law. And that would have continued for 17 years until at the age of 30, they started to become a rabbi and started to teach other people. What's remarkable about this, though, is that that bet uh, midrash was only available to those who were rich. So Jesus, as a poor carpenter's uh, stepson and as a carpenter himself, would not have been part of the bet midrash. Although, as you read in Luke chapter 2, Jesus had incredible pedigree. He had incredible ability. And even the, the, at age 12, he was answering questions that, and asking questions that many Uh, of the Pharisees and doctors of the law were amazed by. So if Jesus probably had enough money, he would have been in that third stage of education. And what's remarkable when you think of it, you know, uh, somebody I once heard tried to say that Jesus maybe was like a trained rabbi. Jesus was not a trained rabbi, according to John 7 and 15, because the people said he had no formal education and that meant he hadn't been to the Bet Midrash. But it's interesting in John 7 and 16 that Jesus said, My doctrine is not my own, but my Father. And it's interesting that in that Bet Midrash, the name that they give to the rabbi who taught them was Abba. They called him Father. And Jesus in in Matthew 23 told the disciples, Do not call any man Father. There's only one Father, and that's God. So even if you link all these scriptures together, Jesus in Luke 2 could not have joined the Bet Midrash, that third stage of rabbinical teaching, because he was not rich enough to do so. He instead um, was amazed, but everybody was amazed by him because he had this immense teaching. Amazingly, Jesus started his ministry at age 30, at the age a rabbi would have started his ministry. But this is the crucial thing. Jesus' rabbi who trained him was Abba Father. And you may not have formal education, You may not feel that you're particularly gifted in a lot of ways. I'm not gifted in education. I don't have a formal degree. But the point is this. I have a good father. And you have a good father too. And as Jesus said in John John 7 and verse 16, he said, The doctrine is not my own, but my father, my Abba, my rabbi who teaches me. And Jesus could say, Father God is my teacher. The key to discipleship, may I add, is that we are open to the teaching voice of God. We're open to the teaching voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And God can teach us. It's amazing if you're teachable, the things God will teach you. The things that you're open to, God will teach you. I mean, for instance, Jesus said in Matthew 11, he said, come on to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me. I want you to learn of me, Jesus said. Well, what does he want you to learn? Theology, education, higher education, a job, a trade, a profession? No, he said, learn of me for I am humble and I am lowly of heart. The one thing that Jesus said that you and I need above everything else is a humble and teachable spirit. Because if you have a humble and a teachable spirit, Jesus said, you'll know what real rest is. See, if you have pride in your heart, you'll always be restless. You'll always be discontent. You'll always be unhappy. And so we have to realize even today that the reason behind so many of us feeling so restless is we've never learned to be teachable like Jesus was. We have to learn to be like that and be taught by Abba Father. The third wee thing I want to bring before you today, maybe these are just like introductory thoughts before we go into further things. But Jesus, although he was recognized as a rabbi, I mean, he was called rabbi because he spoke with an authority that was greater than the scribes. I mean, how amazing is that? You know, you could be taught by men. You could be taught by men. And and I I really honor education. I really honor people who have grafted and worked hard at their education. I really respect those people so much. But there's something really unique about being taught by God. Because if a person is taught by God, they have authority. Authority. And the way you have authority is you spend time with the author. You, 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 know, you take the word authority, the word author is in it. You can only get authority 
by spending time with the author. And even the Psalm 119 says that because of God's teachings, he says, I'm wiser than my teachers. I mean, God teaches us and we can actually um, access a realm of wisdom that we never thought was possible. Now, the one thing I want you to think about as well here, sorry I'm saying, is that Jesus was a rabbi in many respects. He was, he was a man who had disciples. But Jesus was very different in how he did discipleship than the other Jews. So let's go back to the wee background here for a wee second. Age 13 or so, we've got our very, very promising young Jewish boy who would love to be a rabbi. And what this young boy will do is that he'll leave his family behind. He will seek out, now this is a key thing, the young fellow will seek out a good rabbi who is very knowledgeable and very esteemed and, and highly thought of. And he will join himself to that rabbi. He'll join himself to that school. So for instance, in Acts 22, you read about the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul left his hometown of Tarshish. He went down to Jerusalem and he was taught by a man called Gamaliel, who was an expert in the law in the days of Paul and actually in the days of Jesus as well. So Gamaliel would have been the go-to guy at that particular time. But isn't it interesting that in that story that um, they had to leave their background, they had to then join the rabbi of their choosing and they would become... 24-7 um, co co-inhabitors with that rabbi. They would live with that rabbi 24-7 and then they would also uh, become a servant to him. They would serve that man and they would provide meals for him. They would look after him. They would, they would follow his will and they would be really doing this because they wanted to learn from him all the time and ultimately they wanted to become like him. They wanted to become like him. And in many ways, it was like a platonic father-son relationship for many of these people. Now, this is what's different about Jesus. This will be amazing. Jesus did not choose the promising. He did not choose the, the bright sparks. He did not choose the brilliant people. In actual fact, Jesus picked fishermen who were notoriously uneducated. He chose tax collectors who were not known for being very scrupulous. He chose people that were political zealots who were a wee bit unhinged, you could say. He picked people that were so unlikely to be picked by any rabbi. The second thing is this, is that Jesus chose his disciples. It was normally the disciples that chose Jesus or chose the rabbi. Jesus to turn it the other way. I mean, in John 15, he said, you did not choose me, which was a rabbi statement, but I chose you. And isn't that interesting? The other thing is this, is that Jesus spent 24-7 with his disciples. And Jesus can spend 24-7 with you too because by his Holy Spirit, he's with you always. The amazing thing as well is that Jesus expects us to be his servants. And that word servant in the Bible, by the way, is not just like, oh yeah, I'm just a servant and that. That word is, is a Greek word called doulos, which means slave. I mean, a slave is someone who has no standing, they have no rights. They have no ability to say no. That's what a slave is. And Jesus said, you are my slaves. But isn't it amazing? Again, in John 15, 15, Jesus says, you know, in the rabbi's tradition, he said, you're no longer servants, but I call you friends. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus was asked, your family are here to see you. And Jesus said, whoever does the will of God, the same as my father, my mother, my brother, my sister. In other words, that Jesus modeled a, 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 a discipleship that was like a family, that was like a friendship. But this is not a friendship of equals. Dispel immediately from your mind that you and Jesus are buddies and you can just saddle up to Jesus and just slap him on the back and say, what's the crack with you? That's not going to happen. This is not a relationship of equals. He is Lord. And he said to the disciples, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I tell you to do? So we have to be those that, yes, we're part of the family of God. And yes, we're friends with Jesus, but we must be yielded to the will of God. We have to be. And so today, this is what Jesus was looking for. He's looking for discipleship in our time. He speaks out in verse 34 and he calls you and me into a discipleship relationship. 
He has chose us. Thank God that he chose us. You're only a Christian today because God Almighty chose you to be part of his family. Don't try to explain it. Just enjoy it. I enjoy it. I don't try to get my head around it. I just get my heart involved in it and I enjoy it to no end. That he wanted me in his family. I love that. That as well as that, it wasn't based upon what I could do. No works of righteousness that I could do could ever bring me into discipleship with Jesus. It was his choice. It was his grace. It was his mercy that he freely gave us at the cross that brings us into discipleship. That as well as that, that that Jesus wants to be with us 24-7 by his presence. He wants us to be available to him and he wants to be available for us. That not only that, but Jesus also wants to be the one who teaches us all things. But also, may I say, he wants us to obey his will. And that's what a disciple of Jesus is. Today I could be speaking to someone and you're not yet a disciple of Jesus. You're asking questions about God. You're asking questions about the Bible. You're curious. Jesus said very simply that if we come to him, we will in no wise be cast out. Jesus made it very clear to you and to me that if we will come to God, and repent of our sins, and ask Jesus to be our Lord and our Saviour, he will be that in our lives. He said to the disciples, follow me, follow me. And that's the command he gives to you today, follow him. As I say, we're going into times, I fear, I'm not predicting thus saith the Lord or anything, I'm just looking at trends, I'm just looking at the things that we're, we're facing at the moment, And I don't believe we're going to get it any easier, friends. I think normal's not coming back. But I think we have to step up. I think we need to step up and be true disciples of the Lord Jesus. No time for wishy-washy Christians. No time for Christians who have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. There's no time for that, friends. The time is falling very short. The redemption is coming soon. The Lord is at the door. He's knocking at the door of eternity and he's coming right back to this earth pretty soon. I want to be ready and I want you to be ready too. So today, friends, we're going to look at discipleship over the next few weeks. We're going to look at these verses that Jesus gave. I I was hoping to get a bit further than I did today, but we'll leave that today. That's what discipleship's all about. It's someone that has surrendered to Jesus, that's been taught by Jesus. They're wanting to be formed into Jesus' will and likeness. And we're going to go a bit further into this over the next few weeks. And we want to see disciples raised up at this time. So let's just pray a wee minute here and ask the Lord just to bless us at this time. So, Father God, we thank you so much that you've called us into something so much deeper. So much deeper than, than just casual Sunday morning church attendance. You've called us into something more than meetings. You've called us to follow Jesus, that we would know him, obey him, Lord, pursue him. And I just pray, Abba Father, that you will, Lord, loose the Holy Spirit of truth and transformation into all of the lives of your people, that we will become, Lord, those who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just churchgoers, not just those who said a prayer, not just those who say, I'm born again, I'm saved, don't bother me anymore but real all-out disciples for Jesus. Because, Lord, we know the kingdom of God is in us and we need that unshakable kingdom to be in us at the days that we're lying, that we're living in and lying ahead of us. So I just seal your word into people's hearts today and pray that, Lord God, it will bear much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.